the most holy God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our maker, the eternal God, the everlasting I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the Alaye Raye of Aye Raye, we come and we bow our heart and bow our knees before you. You are the I God, the most I one, the most holy God. We are alive today because you have given us the breath of life. It's in you we live, we move, and we have our being. We appreciate the fact that you have created us in your image. You gave us Jesus to redeem you back unto yourself. You put in us your spirit. You have bestowed upon us all your treasures in heaven. You have given us your name. You have given us your words. We praise you. We honor you. We hallow you. We sanctify you in our lives, in our homes, in our midst, in our nation, and on earth today. We say be praised and adored in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go into your word, oh, that you will speak to the heart of every one of us. Oh, that each one of us will hear you. Oh, that your word will change us, will strengthen us, we empower us, we give us reason to continue living, we supply wings to our soul as we sail on, as we soar on in life, so that our lives will be fulfilled, will be fruitful, profitable, efficient, fulfilling your purpose, blessing the human race. And at the end of this life, we will die empty. Nor retaining anything you have asked us to do. But we will discharge upon the earth all that you have premeditated over our lives before you sent us here. Thank you, mighty Holy Spirit. As you take control of our spirit soul, and in the name of Jesus, I stand and I rebuke Satan. I rebuke and I cast you out. I sanctify this atmosphere unto the law. I say Jesus is Lord. We receive every blessing, every addition, every increase, every multiplication, every grace, every help, every, every direction, every instruction, every rebuke, every correction, every encouragement, every exhortation that the Lord is sending to us today. In the name of Jesus. And at the end of this service, each one will have been made better, will have been purified, will have been strengthened. In the name of Jesus, every sorrow, every depression, every discouragement, I rebuke you and I say, let every one of us be filled with the life of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And we take our seat before the Lord. I want to appreciate God for this opportunity and I appreciate the pastor for giving me this opportunity to share with God's people. I believe God has something to say to you, to myself. It's, I have a big job this morning. I know the Holy Spirit is going to help me because we are going to go through a lot of points. I know all of us, we know the scriptures. So as the points, as I mentioned the point to us by the Lord, each one of us, you, you will supply the scriptural references by yourself because I know we know the scriptures. But I want us to firstly go to First Timothy chapter 4, that's where we are actually going to be reading 1 Timothy chapter 4 and I'm going to be reading from verse 12. Let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in word, 
in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Verse 15, where I'm really going. Meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. The whole KJV says, meditate on these things that your profiting may appear to all. Your progress. The scripture is talking about profiting, about progress. Take it to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I'm going to read that verse 15 again. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. That's the life God asks for us as his children. He wants our profiting our progress to be evident unto her. And I was surprised. I was reading one chapter of the Bible this week. I can't remember the exact place now. The scripture says God is a merchant. It, it, this new, you know, it said God is a merchant. And you will know if someone is a merchant, it means that's an enterprising person like an entrepreneur who want profit by all means? So God wants you to profit with life. He wants me to profit in life and with life. So these lessons, you know, the, the topic of what we are going to be going through this morning is critical lessons for an efficient life. Critical lessons for an efficient life. And what is an efficient life? An efficient life. When you say something is efficient, it means it's working in a well-organized and competent way. So as Christians, as even human beings, I discovered recently that it's only those of us who are Christians that we have just gotten into that higher purpose of God for our lives of what we know about God. The plan of God for the human race when he made us is to live a successful, progressive, profitable life. But sin came, Satan came, and that is the need for God coming in the flesh as Jesus to redeem us back to his original purpose for our lives. So if we say an efficient life, it's a life that is achieving maximum productivity with minimum wasted effort or minimum expense. For us to live an efficient life on the heart, knowing fully well, the purpose of God tells us, God said, with long life, I will satisfy you. And we read in Genesis, God said, at your life shall be 120 years. So if there is anything you are planning for as a child of God, plan for 120 years. And you know we can actually plan for it. What do you want to... What, and if we sit down and we plan for it, you are 30 years old now. The next 30, the next 30, the next 30. What can we project in faith? We can use our imagination. If we will walk by the word of God, if we will hit right, if we will do our exercise, obey the laws of it, if Jesus tarries, we can live up to our 120 years. Or if it is 100 years you want, that's fine. And we are in a country where there is very good earth service. So whichever way you want to do it, we can live it. But the quantity of our life is not what matters, but the quality of our lives. 
the outcomes, the output, the impact our lives make on earth. So God wants us to achieve maximum productivity with minimum wasted efforts. God doesn't just want us to parabolate around. And as children of God, we are not to live a life of trial and error. God said, meditate on these things. So as we are going to be considering this point this morning, see God he saying to you, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. That means if we can give ourselves entirely to these things, the product of our life will be profit, will be progress, you know, and it will be evident to all. Evident to you, to your friends, to your enemy, to your neighbors in the body of Christ. And the number one point we're considering, first of all, is get God involved with your life. Man was not designed to function without God. The Bible tells us, and God said, let us make a man in our own image after our own likeness and let them have dominion. And the scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, he that built all things is who? His God. So if you are going to live an efficient life, God must be involved in your life. We are not as human beings designed to function without God. We learned it by the word of God. Whatever God does, it's always good and far, far better than what a man can do. Human beings, we are limited. Limited in knowledge, limited in power, limited in capacity. No matter how efficient our brains are working, our mind are working, we can never be as efficient as God who knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The scripture says, known unto God are his works before the foundation of the earth. God, he plans, he does all things according to his plan. Before we existed, you know, we shouldn't fall for the scientific lies of evolution. Who started the Big Bang? Each one of us, whoever you have, wherever you you listening to the word of God today, you were created. At the convention that he was telling us, the Bible actually was written to believers, people who we choose to believe. The Bible did not introduce God to us. He just presented God to us. The scripture in Genesis 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning, what is the next thing? God. So God is the beginning of life. God is the beginning of creation. God is the beginning of all beginning. We cannot query him. We can see it. It is evident. Men are failed. Things are failing. Government systems, processes are failing. And that tells us, human being, we are not in control. God has only given us a measure of control that we, that we exert upon our world. We may plan to go to Mars, to go to whatever planet, if we eventually get there, it is just part of the discovery of the plan of God, of the dominion. The scripture says, heaven is the throne of God. The heart he has given to the son of man. Whatever we do to the earth, whatever we are able to achieve on the planet, on the universe, that is what God has given to us. The scripture tells us, secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed, they are for us and for our children. So if you are going to live an efficient life, 
God must be involved in your life. You must deliberately, intentionally, as an individual, get out of the crowd and involve God in your life. And that starts by acknowledging him as your creator, by getting into a vital living relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion is a bondage. Having a relationship with God is what brings the life of God into our spirit. And if there is something God wants with the children of men, the book of Proverbs chapter 8 tells us, God said, my delight is with the sons of men. The delight of God is with us, children, human beings. God wants fellowship. He wants us to be in fellowship with him. And that can only happen through the Lord Jesus Christ. By giving our heart to him as our savior and, and allow him to be the Lord of our life. Jesus said in Acts chapter 4 verse 10 to 12 tells us. You know, if you read it down, the scripture says, There is no other name that is given unto us among men. Whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. Jesus. John 14 verse 6 tells us, said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to the Father except by me. Christianity is not claiming dominance over every other religion. Christianity that is even practiced as a religion is a bondage. It's falsehood. What God wants is for human beings to come into relationship with him. And that is through Christ. Why it has evolved to be Christianity is because there is Christ in it and there is the living of the life of Christ that we have to do. So it is not just by name. It is not by maybe water baptism. It is not by you have joined a church. It is by acknowledging. The scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you are going to receive the everlasting life that Jesus asked for you, you must firstly acknowledge the father, you were lost in sin. Like the pastor says the other time, why human beings, why we, we really want to accept that God is God, that there is the existence of God, is because we want to deny accountability to God. God created us. He put us on this earth. We are accountable to him at the end of life as we know it. There is an end of life as we know it. There is an end of this earth. The circles are turning. They are turning. One day, each one of us will face God. The scripture tells us, every one of us that has passed up onto this or, or that has passed through this world we appear before god one day check your heart down down in your heart listen to god in your heart and you will know god is god exists there is a god in heaven who controls the affair of men who controls the unseen and the seen world. You may choose to deny it, but you must be ready to, to face God at the end of your life. And another thing, under acknowledging God as your Savior, if you are born again, you're a child of God, you have given your heart to Jesus, celebrate your redemption. Celebrate your salvation. A man of God said, at the convention that the greatest achievement of man on heart is his redemption. That God illuminated your heart. You saw the need for a savior. You knew you needed God. And you, your heart responded to him. It is your greatest achievement to be saved. The scripture says, what shall it profit a man if he gains this old world and he loses his soul? Many great scientists have lived on the earth and they have passed. 
Many great politicians have lived on the earth and they have passed. They have passed. You know, you will even see relics of what many people have done. The scripture says, once the breath of a man leaves him, that is the end of that man. People have achieved great feats in life. Many people climb Mount Everest. The first man that landed on the moon, is he still on the heart? Different things have been, have been discovered in life. Who is it that can deliver a man from the day of, earth, of death? If we are to consider the level of the advancement in science and technology, humans should not die. But the Bible says, who can redeem the soul of a man in the day of death? For our redemption is precious. The redemption of our soul from sin from the devil is precious. So if you are redeemed, if you are saved, celebrate your redemption. Hold on tightly to it. Come to a point that you make a decision. It's either God or nothing. If you have to choose between continuing to live on the earth and your salvation, brothers and sisters, I beg you, choose to leave the earth. Choose your salvation. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Another major lesson. God wants and always respond to only seekers and sincere inquirers. God wants, God desires holy seekers and sincere inquirers. If you will become sincere in your heart in seeking after God, you want answers to the questions of life. Go to God sincerely. I read of a woman who said she was from the Muslim background, but her heart started turning towards God. And she said, I dare to call him father. She spoke in her, she said she stood in her room one day and said, Lord God Almighty, I have loved and I have served you. Will you please reveal yourself to me? If you are the God that the Bible talked about, and God revealed himself unto him, unto her. So if you do not know what is the truth, the Bible says that if you want to do the will of God, you shall know. The book of Osea 3 verse 3 tells us, then shall we know if we follow on to know the law. If you sincerely want to know, if you want answers to questions in life, ask God sincerely. He always responds to sincere seekers. But if you are just a jester, and all you say is, God, if you exist, just kill me. He is not going to do that. He knows you are talking out of folly. It's like a tiny hand boasting against the elephant. That's who we are. The Bible says, Though every one of us on the earth, we are all together lighter than vanity, lighter than nothing. So if you are a holy seeker, if you will open your heart and seek after God, the scripture says we will know. And as you seek God, he makes himself more known unto us day by day. You know, precept upon precept. Line upon line, here a little, there a little, you know, he makes himself known unto us. It may not be, it may not be very loud, it may not be spectacular. The revealing of God. Can we go to first Samuel, please? The revealing of God to you, the manifestation of God to you might not be spectacular, but if it is supernatural spiritual. Please receive it 
and mostly God makes himself known unto us from his word. First Samuel chapter 3, okay, the scripture says in the last verse, then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself, that's verse 21, the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So if you are a holy seeker, the Bible is the written out will of God. Go to the scriptures. He will reveal himself to you by his word. His word can come into your heart as an idea, as a thought. He will reveal himself. And as we lay hold on his word, we will see that our lives will have less wastage. We have more profit and we will progress. Then, God wants you to know it's a lesson we must learn that you are a stakeholder in the program of God for your life. You are a stakeholder. God is not going to live your life for you. You have your life to live. I have my life to live. He gave us our lives to live. He wants us to live it in dependence of him. Asking, receiving, believing, activating his help all the way. You must understand, I must understand. You are a unique individual, individual <coughs> with unique characteristic, and that you are precious to God. God wants us to understand we will live an efficient life when we come to the realization that we agree that I am unique in the hands of God. He gave you your temperament. He gave you your, your, your everything. And it has a unique plan, a unique purpose for you. you. You are a stakeholder. You can choose to live with God. You can choose to live without God. And God is going to respect your choice. He made us as free moral agents. He gave us the power of the will. You can exercise your will to choose good, to choose God. You can exercise your will to choose evil, to choose the devil. Whatever choice you make, he is going to respect it. He won't force himself on you, but also remember, you cannot force yourself on God. You cannot force your sacrifice on him. You cannot force your life on him. You are accountable to him. God is superior to man. No matter how superior you feel you are as a man, he's just in the animal kingdom, like the biologist classified us. God is the most high God, the most holy God, the king of kings, the creator of men, the one who who can snap life out of us and nothing can come out of it? So we, if we are going to live an efficient life, we must realize it. I am unique in the hands of the Lord. I am precious to him. He's given me my unique characteristic. I will accept it. I will live my life by him. It depends on your decision. There is a destiny preordained for you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us in Amplified Version, if we read it, the good work, he has ordained, there is an ordained destiny, a premeditated life, a premeditated outcome. And that's why God said in Jeremiah 29 level, he said, I will give you an expected end. There is an, when God looks at you, looks at me, looks at every one of us on the earth, there is an expected end. There is something is expected from your life, from my life. So we must realize that. And that's why we must always run after him. We must always run after him. Our lives are like scrolls. 
as we follow God, he unfold a, a face. As we press in, as we get faithful, as we obey the one he releases to us, you know, he unfolds another face. Who could, whoever saw Joseph the day he got to the land of Egypt, who could ever say that a, a, an ordinary slave boy with no, no cloth on him in chains, with no one knowing his name, would be Christ to become the prime minister of Egypt, the greatest country of, you know, of civilization in those days, to become in, just in the space of 13 years. There is a premeditated path. There is a preordained outcome. There is a destiny upon your life. And that is what we call calling. Every one of us is called of God. Every human being on the earth. The Bible says there is a light. Jesus is the light that lighted everyone that come on this heart. The light of God is in you. Sin might have darkened it. You might not be able to perceive it. But once we give our heart to Jesus, the lamp is lighted again. The scripture says there is a spirit in man. The inspiration of the almighty. Give them what? Wisdom. Give them understanding. Your spirit is the candle of the Lord. It is quenched by sin. But when, you, when we obey and we accept the offer of Jesus, and do you know, the only thing we've got to do as human is just to accept that, Lord, I just know I am not complete in myself. The dissatisfaction in your life, the dissatisfaction in you, is that is your spirit calling out to God is maker to find fulfillment. Many people will say, I don't know what I want to do with my life. They throw themselves into charity work. Many people throw themselves into volunteer, into volunteering, and I want to do this, I want to help this way. You are still not satisfied. It is the death of God in your spirit, the breath that God gave you at creation that is calling out unto God. And as we yield, as we, as we, as we seek to follow, as we seek to fulfill the purpose of God, there is that satisfaction that comes. That nobody, nothing in life can satisfy the hunger of God, the calling of destiny. There is a, there is a summon of destiny upon the life of every one of us. Whoever you become, the summon will be there. That hunger, that vacuum will be there. Only God can fill it. Become the best. Become the wealthiest man on the earth. If you have not found God, if you have not found the destiny that God created for you, there is, that, there is still the hollowness. There is still the vacuum. There is still that big gap deep down within your heart that only God can fill. And my dear brother and sister, you may not have a dime to your name. If you have found the Lord, if you are following, if you, have, if you are responding to the summon of the divine destiny, the divine plan that God has for your life, you will be satisfied. You must take responsibility to grow up in your pursuit of God. To grow up in your knowledge of God in order to live your life right. There are three outcomes of life. The good life. The almost right life. And the right life. The good life. You have every material possession. You are living in health. You are achieving. Maybe in your career you are rising. You are achieving. That's the good life. You might have a title in church. You may be involved in social enterprise. You might be involved in charity. You're doing a lot. You're just doing good. That is the good life. 
You may be a Christian following after the Lord, but you are doing your, you are walking your own Christianity your own way in your convenience, and you're just doing what you can, managing as best as you can. That is the almost right life. There is the highest life of the right life. And we see that example in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, my will is to do, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish it. Do his will and finish it. Not just doing 90%. God is a God who will take all or none from you. He is a God that will take none or all from us. God, God, we may have our own definition of God, but there is the Bible definition of God. God is not a Santa Claus. God is not a Father Christmas. He is a Father. He, he is a God, a Lord, a trainer. Who teaches, who trains, who disciplines, who corrects, who molds, who sets on course, who sends on errand. That's God. Who molds us to conform to his image. Like a good father, you want your son, your daughter to be able to ably represent you. Can you imagine if any of the senior lawyers in this nation is misbehaving. We see what has happened. The one who has not lived up to responsibility. We see what has happened. So also God. So we have a responsibility as individual. If our lives will be efficient. To grow in our knowledge of God. To grow in our pursuit of God. Until we find it out. We will keep finding out. We will keep discovering things to uh, 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 about God. We will keep discovering the mind of God and the will of God for us is per moment, per moment, per moment, per moment. We have been told God is a talking spirit. Every time he leads us, the same God who led Philip to go and start a citywide crusade in Samaria is the same God who asked him, go into the wilderness. And join yourself to the chariot of that man. That is the God we serve. That is the life of the living Christian life. The voice of the Lord leading us part time. So we must, and another lesson is that we must learn to get things right. And keep getting better till the end of our life or till Jesus comes. Walking with God, we have been taught it's a marathon race. Walking with God is a lifetime thing. You keep qualifying yourself. You keep following. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed. He said, no one lays his hand on the plow and look back and is fit for the kingdom of God. When you stop growing, you start dying. When you stop improving, what do we think, what, what do we think organizations send people do training or do refresher course here and there? If we do it in the flesh, we will see that if we do it in the physical, it is just an example for us of what we have to do with our life. Keep getting better. You can know God more. You can be holier. You can be um, more humble. You can be more praiseful. You can be more peaceful. You can be more loving. You can be more caring. You can be more accommodated. Till we leave the surface of this earth, God expects us to keep continuing. So continue. It's a watchword. Can you tell somebody beside you, please continue. Even when you feel discouraged, still continue. When you don't feel like praying, can you just get on your seat and say, Father, I don't feel like praying today. I am just going to sit there. Sit there before the Lord. 
You don't feel like praising, like worshiping. Just get before the Lord. Open your mouth and say, Father, I don't feel like worshiping you today. But because I do not have any other alternative, we must get to that level in our life. There is no other alternative to God. What is the alternative? The devil. I discover the devil is such a taskmaster. The devil is such a no-nonsense taker. God is so merciful. When we, when we make mistakes, I will say, oh, Father, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He forgives. I say, don't do it again. But the devil is going to punish you for every mistake you have. The devil is going to deceive you. <laughs> he is going to punish you. At the end of everything, you are still going to face the wrath of God. Because the devil himself is reserved. Demons are reserved in, in, in chains of darkness until the day of judgment. The devil eventually will, collect, will, will take his judgment. The judgment of rebelling against God. Human being, we cannot afford to rebel against God and feel there is no consequence. The consequences are coming. The consequences are coming. It is just that God is giving because of his love. The Bible says we shouldn't take his love, his mercy for granted. His, his love, his mercy is leading us to repentance. He's leading us to repentance. A day will come. Why do you think God sent his angel? He said, go to, go to Sodom and Gomorrah for me and see. He the voice of the assay that is coming up to me, if it's exactly as it is, as we do all our things, human beings on there, the voice of everything we do on earth, our activities on earth are going before the Lord, and a day is coming, he will visit this earth again. He came, the, he created it, he came the first time as the lamb that died for our souls, the assay. He is coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah to avenge everyone who will say no to him. And it's a grave thing. The Bible says, for we know the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of God. Kingdoms have risen, they have waned. People have lived on this wall. They have died and their memory perished and perished forever. The scripture says there is no new things under heaven. Things that are past is still what it is coming in different form. And again, God remains the same. It's a wise decision to choose to live your life with God. It's a wise decision to choose to be on the side of God. Then, another lesson, if your life will be efficient, you must make powerful decisions about your life and not just drift through life. You must make powerful decisions. We have our desires. We have the power of our choice. We have the power of our action. You must make powerful decisions. And decisions are what your decisions are. The decisions you have made back up with action plan. And that you are engaging in the action plan. If you have made a decision, you are not following it up with action. They are just mere wishes. They will never come to pass. What is your decision? How far have you decided to work with the Lord? What impact have you decided that your life is going to have? Are you going to join the number of people who know the Lord and forget about him? Are you going to join the people of the people who, who, who want all their whole life alone? I just want to enjoy my life. At the head, there have been people at their deathbed, they knew they died sorrowfully. There have been people at their deathbed, they died with hope. They died with joy on their heart. My beloved, there is nothing like, there is no life after death. There is a life, a longer life after death than the life we have. And the life after death is an eternal life. You are an eternal being. God gave you your breath. You, will ne you can drop your body. You will never cease to exist. 
is either you are going to live in eternal damnation, eternal punishment, eternal sorrow and bitterness or with the devil, or you are going to live in eternal bliss with God. Don't let the devil deceive you. The devil is a deceiver. The devil does not know everything about your life. The devil himself knows his own hand. He knows he has failed. And the Bible tells us, can we go to Psalm 8? The Bible tells us, so that you will know you are so precious to God. And it, it will be very good if you can make a decision to follow the Lord, to serve him, to live your life for him, to live it with him, so that you can have the end of God. The Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants. You have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. That's the devil. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him. As a man, God is mindful of you. And the son of man, that you visit him. Do you know God visits you? He visits us as human. He visits you in your dream. He visits you sending words of love, sending words of, of redemption to you. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. God crowned you as a man, as a human being, with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, that, that pass through the path of the sea. These human beings, we are on the heart as a list. God has given us a list on the heart. We will return his heart unto him. We will give accounts for whatever we have done with the heart he has given to us. As individually, individually. So get out of the hard mentality. Get out of the crowd. There is no, the Bible says a fool says in his heart, there is no God. That means when you say there is no God, the Bible calls you a fool. But God wants you to be wise. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to acknowledge him. The greatest error, the greatest evil you can do yourself is to ignore God. He is behind every misery. He is behind everything. Everything that is happening in our days has been prophesied in the word of God. Scientists have come and they have changed theory. The word of God has never changed. So it will do you a whole world of good to tie your life to things that does not, things that do not change. God does not change. His word does not change. So you have got to make powerful decisions that you need to call a conference, call yourself to a conference and make your decisions. Don't just drift through life. Make your decisions about your life, about your marriage, about your finances, about your children, about your service in church, about your impact in life, about your contributions. And I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Another lesson. Never see your life in isolation of the church of God. You are not meant to function alone. You need accountability partners. Fellow Christians can be your accountability partner. The church of God. God has established the church. When we come to church, it's a duty, it's a delight. The Bible says, never forsaking the assembly of one another. Coronavirus came. We took the church online. Very good. But that was actually not the original way. God, the Bible says, when the church started, they were meeting every day 
it, from house to house, they were breaking bread, taking communion. House to house, and in the temple, they were meeting. It is civilization that brought a lot of things. Microwave, church service. Ten minutes. Open prayer, two seconds. Waste worship, once. You don't get drunk in a hurry. If you want to be filled of God, how many of us, we, we do school, we do our academic, we give 12 hours to jobs. When we come to church and we don't go to our boss, to, we don't stomp into our boss's offices to say, these 12 hours, uh, hours I have to spend here. I'm so sorry today, I've changed my mind. I'm going to only spend two hours. Half I go, my salary, pay it at the end of the month. You are going, no, nobody does that. But when we come to church, it, that's when we say, ah, this pastor, oh my God. Whoever you are, whatever race, whatever gender, you cannot get drunk on God. You can't know God. He, whatever you don't give your time to, you cannot know, you can't excel at it. So never see yourself in isolation. There is something that happens in church that does not happen in the house of any one of us. It does not even happen in the house of general overseers, of churches, of organization, of ministries. It doesn't. When Zion is in session, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. Sometimes, as human beings, we don't feel like coming, but still come. As we are here this morning, God is here. His angels are here. We cannot see them. We cannot feel them. But because he has said, you only need to sincerely pray. If you, want to op if you want to see the angels in church, pray sincerely and ask God, God, your word says you are in our, open my eyes to see you. If you want it, you go to God and pray and he will show himself to you. The pastor has told us of someone who will put a, a, a chair for Jesus to sit down and he will be there communing with him. After doing it for several months, he saw Jesus. Do you know that if need be, God will reveal himself to you physically, if need be. But if there is no need to it, he said, blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. Christianity is a life of faith. We have got to just adjust our mind to believe the world. It's either you take it or you leave it. And the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. So if you want to please God, you have to relate with him by faith. Just believe his word. Do you know he said test? You can test the word of God. You can prove it. It is religion that we say, don't, 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 don't. it is religion, it's falsehood. But the truth of the word, you can prove it. You go and look for an instruction that God puts in his word. You obey it with all your heart and see if the outcome will come or not. So the church of God is to prepare you for what God has prepared for you. So never see yourself in isolation of the word of God. Nobody of the church of God. Nobody will ever be bigger than the church of God. The Bible says God has set some in the church. Apostle, prophet, pastors, teachers, evangelists. For the what? For the keeping of the saints. For the work of ministry. The church is to keep you to try to easy As we relate together in the church. A sister we see, you talk too much, brother. So, so, so. You learn that. Another brother will say, you, you get angry too much. You are changed. The pastor will give you, you are going to share tomorrow. You will go and pray. You will go, you, die. you, you want to listen to God. We are trained. We are equipped. And we manifest. And as a matter of fact, a member of the church is a leader in the world. The people of the world, we talk about emotional intelligence. 
Emotional intelligence, is it not the outworking of the fruit of the Spirit? Then we say emotional intelligence. Know what triggers you. Know how you are going to control it. Is it not self-control that the Bible has talked about? You know, uh, the people of the world, they have taken, they rejected the person of Jesus. They have taken his principles and they are, they are, they are using it. And it's working for them. The Bible says, see a man diligent in his work. He will stand before king, not before me. They will say, work hard, work harder, work smarter. As the Bible not spoken to us, you go to the hand if you are lazy. As the Bible not spoken to us that a slack hand will do what? A, by the means of a slack hand, the, the, the roof will start dropping. As the Bible not told us that the hand of the diligent bear the rule, who do they promote in the office? Is it not people they see as competent, working with the values of your organization? But if we take on the word of God that says the hand of the diligent be read the rule, and the scripture says the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. But if you are righteous and you are not taking to the, the advice of the word of God that says he that is diligent, you may be righteous and you are not diligent at all. Unbelievers who is diligent at all, they will get the promotion. They will score the mark in class. If you are, if you are so stupid as a child of God, you say, I'm praying, praying, praying. You are not studying your books. You are not going to classes. I discover principles of the work of God of God works for us. It's only when you contravene another one, it works against us. So never see your life in as a Christian. You will never become anything great if you ignore the church of God. They may offend you there. Oh, forgive. That is the word. Go back there. You may not like the church as it, as it is. God has not given to any one of us to choose the church that we attend. The Bible says he places everyone in the body as a cement faith. How did you decide the biological family you came into? Did God call you to a God call you to a conference and say, Do you want to go to Africa, Europe, or Asia? Didn't you just meet yourself there? So also, when you became born again, your second birth, God has a way of leading you to the church. You may not even like your pastor. You you in your flesh, you want a phonetic speaking pastor. And here is it. Your pastor is a rugged evangelist. You have got to accept. Did you change your dad? Did you change your mom? So never, if we are going, to, if our life will be without waste, if our life will be efficient, if our life will bring profit, if our life will bring progress, we must honor the church. Honor the church of God. Honor the authority, the leadership God has set there. Submit to its our processes and become who God wants to make you. Your life is much more important than material possessions. That's another lesson we've got to learn. The quality of our life is more, the Bible says the life of a man does not consist in the abundance of what he has. It is the plan of God that our needs are met. He wants us to have desirable things, good things of life. But as he says, do not count your life based on your material possessions. We have heard of people like Mother Teresa. We have heard of people like uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Who gave all the heart? We have learned about Florence Nightingale. She came from a very wealthy family. Used all her wealth. That is life. It's not about what we amass. It, you know, material things should not be the source of your joy. The Bible says even if riches increase, do not set your heart on it. You know, this is a generation. This is the life. So many people are down with mental health issues today because of unsatisfaction, because of covetousness, because of greed. I want to have this. My friend has bought Ferrari. I must buy my own. My friend has bought iPhone 77. I must buy iPhone 100. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to just, just pursue after the worth of life. 
If you are ever going to desire where, desire to be able to give, desire where to be able to help others. There are many, many, even in this country, many, many people are suffering. Many, many people are, they are, they are living in, in penury. So, don't let material possession get hold of your heart. The Bible talks about deceitfulness of riches. And there is also deceitfulness of sin. Don't be overtaken with deceitfulness of riches. You may have all the money in life. If you don't have health, what do you do? What happens? They know it. Great things have been prepared for us in Christ. In redemption. Great things. So don't aim low. Aim I in God. Don't be a mediocre. Great things have been prepared for us in Christ. In redemption. All things are yours. You only need to press into Christ by faith to assess them. Don't aim low. Don't be, don't, don't, don't be a stupid Christian. Take the whole world and give me Jesus. I'm satisfied. It's an error. We have to participate in life. How many times have you taken your Bible? You get to Tesco and you, have, you, have, you, have, you, have, you, you filled your shopping cart. When you get to Tesco, after you have scanned it, you just take your Bible. <laughs> have you ever done that? This is a world where we spend pounds. So you must have the pounds to spend. But there is another better way we can do it. If you don't have the pound for whatever reason, for I would say for a legitimate reason, you can exercise your faith. Just take your book. Make a list of what you've got. Present it before your father. Father, I need this. I need this. I receive it. This is your word. This is your word. And you can sit there, right there. Waiting for somebody to knock on your door. The Holy Spirit has spoken to another brother or another sister. And said, buy this, buy this, buy this. Without seeing your list, the Holy Ghost lead them. Buy this. That is a God that we serve. The God of miracles. That is, has him as Christians. We cannot be stranded. And it brings all, everything you need. Even more. It tops it up. With some other things you will need maybe in a week's time that you didn't remember to list. So we must have that mindset. We must have that the realization must break out in our spirit. All things, great things, not just ordinary things. Great things have been prepared for us in Christ. In redemption, all things are ours. We only need to work it out and assess them by our faith. If you have Jesus, you have everything. Settle down in him and get the best. Every blessing of God became your possession the day you gave your heart to Jesus. So we must learn to pray. And that's why we must learn to pray right. We must pray from position of advantage, not as victims. We may not Know it all for now. But my dear brother and sister, we cannot be stranded. Then you must know you have a calling from the Lord. There is your higher calling. There is your low calling. I think I'm just going to round off very soon. You have a calling. Your career is like your low calling, the platform for which to fulfill your higher calling. All that God asks for you is not just to be the greatest scientist who found the cure to HIV, coronavirus, uh, monkeypox, and all of it. That is not the highest purpose of God for your life. It is just a platform to bless fellow human beings. My brothers and sisters, if somebody lives in the most great earth on earth, 
is he not going to die? He will still die. He will still leave this surface of the earth. So if all you strive for, after your first degree, you're taking the second degree, another master's degree, another master, seven master's degree, 17 PhDs, and you become professor and professor emeritus. After, when you say, hey, and we are buried, can you share your certificate? Can your children even use your certificate on the heart? No. So as we do that, to be part of what is happening on the heart, God expects us to begin to rise up and say, Lord, what will you have me do? Do you know if God has given you the higher calling of an encourager, a brother comes to the church so dejected, the devil has put in his heart to go and commit suicide. Not even a brother, somebody, your, your neighbor, that you don't even talk to, and the Holy Spirit say, can you smile to that young man this morning? And you get out and you smile. Hello? That might be the saving grace. And it changes his mind. The devil has convinced him. You are so terrible that nobody will even say hello to you. And here you are. God said hello. Do you know you have saved a soul? How much can NHS pay you? Do you know that NHS go to the fact of if it is 16 officials for somebody not to commit suicide, they can pay for 16 officials and people still go ahead and commit the suicide. We have had stories of people who God knows what came over them. They, they have issue, they have eating disorder. They just stop eating. When you give them liquid milk, they go secretly to go and vomit. And NHS will do all things and they will still not be able to make it. But here you are, you're a child of God. The person just gets conversing with you and say, I don't even know, I'm just fed up of life. And you say, Jesus can help you. If you only trust in him, can I pray with you, Father, in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And you, you are even thinking, ha, ah, the Bible verse I quoted, ah, it was, ah, it was half I remember. But you have quoted the half. And God is working with the half. And that person changes his or her mind. And is living his life. Fulfill the number of his days. Have you not done something invaluable? May we value what we have. Do we think it's everybody who has songs on their mind? So many people are working this country. They are, they are living corpses. Dead. Dead. So far gone. Many people so lonely. And you, will, you look into their eyes, you will see, you see vacuum. Hopelessness. But when everybody says, are you all right? They say, yes, I'm all right. I'm all right. But you know. Ha. Huh. So, let's seek out. Let's reach out. Ah, your calling may not be spectacular. You may not be the next Billy Graham. You may not be Rayard Bonke. You may not be Graham Frank. You, are not, you may not be Franklin Graham. But you are just yourself. Touching lives. Blessing people around you. Nobody may even say thank you to you. But if we will only press into our higher calling, we will fulfill purpose. Then you must know, you must succeed and excel in the calling of God over your life. You, you, I think that's where I'm going to round off. You must succeed and excel over the calling of God upon your life. You must succeed. Can you help me tell somebody? It is a must for you. You must succeed. Not just succeed. You must excel in the calling of God over your life. Your high calling and your low calling. You must succeed in your place of work. You must succeed in your marriage. You must succeed over your children. A husband. You must succeed over your wife. A wife. You must succeed over your husband and your children. 
You must succeed in your calling, your low calling, your high calling. You must succeed. Whatever you have to do, it is a mandate of God over you. It's a mandate of God over us. We must succeed and excel in the call of God over your life. Your life must not be a waste. Your life must not be without impact. You must not count your life in terms of physical possessions you have. But at the same time, you must believe God. It is possible to suffer as a Christian. If you don't know things that have been freely given to you, has it ever, has it ever happened to you? You have money in your pocket. But you, you, you thought you forgot it at home. You have your card on you, but you thought you forgot it. Here you are, just sitting down, watching as others are eating. And you're thinking, oh my God, I forgot my money. After the, everything is gone, the, your, your lunch time is over. You can't get that again. You now see your card. That is suffering in ignorance. God doesn't want us to suffer. You must, ex you must succeed. And excel in the calling of God upon your life. And if it is going to be, it's up to you. If you are going to succeed, if you are going to excel, it's up to you. Your life is a responsibility given to you by God. He put ability in you, respond to that ability. Can we bow down our head and respond to God? Critical lessons for an efficient life. A life without, with minimum waste. A competent, structured, ordered life. Progressive, profitable, profiting life. Profiting God. Profiting human beings. Can you respond to God? I receive grace. Your life is your responsibility to live. Powerful decisions. Acknowledging God. Living, you know, Depending on God always. Respond to God. Receive grace. And my brothers and sisters, don't turn your responsibility to prayer points. You only need to receive grace and strength to make your decisions, to map out your action points. What are you going to do? You must know God. What are you going to do? If you are going to know God, you, you must study the Bible yourself. If you are going to exercise faith that we get physical, material things delivered to you, you must build that faith. You know, we, you, you must build the faith. You must listen to the word of God. You must hear it. You must believe it. You must receive it. You must meditate on it. You are an outcome. One of the lessons that your life is an outcome of the, you are the product of your meditation. What do you think about? How do you see yourself? The calling of God, the knowledge of God. Can you speak to God? Lord, help me to make a profit out of my life. My life must not be a waste. Lord, I receive grace. Lord, I receive strength to lay hold. The Bible says meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely unto them. Meditate. That's action point. Action plan. Action point. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely unto them. That means if we hear again and we don't meditate, if we hear and we meditate and we don't give ourselves, if we don't consciously begin to take actions and take steps, you know, that we work these things into our lives. It means our life will not bring out any profit. I receive grace. I will not just drift on in life. I will not just drift on in life. I receive grace to be structured, to be intentional about my life. In the I receive grace to press into you, to follow you, to know. Lord, help me in the name of Lord. I receive grace to press on, to press on, to keep following in the to continue. In whether I'm discouraged, whatever, to just continue with you in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Put your hands together. Uh, 
Has the Lord spoken to us this morning? Just take a minute to pray for the vessel that the Lord has used. Ask for a refill. Every time a person stands before us to disperse the word of God, virtue goes out of that person. So ask the Lord for a refill, for a strengthening, for grace, for a refill, for a strengthening, for grace, for a refill, for a strengthening, for grace. Lord, we receive more grace. Receive an increase of the anointing. Increase an, an inc- we receive an increase of power. We receive an increase of help. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. You know, she mentioned a lot of things today. And interestingly, one of the things that caught my eyes, my attention the most was one of the things she said as she was closing. She said, don't turn your responsibilities into prayer points. You know, that's what many, many children of God have been doing for a long, long time. Oh, Lord, do this, do that. And God is saying, well, that's your job. And you're saying, Lord, do my job. And God is saying, no, do your own job. Lord, help me know the scriptures. And God says, well, read the scriptures so I can open your understanding. You said, Lord, help me to know the scriptures. God says, open your Bible and read. I said, help me to know. You says, well, open your mouth and pray. And then we say, Lord, well, you have not done this. You have not done that. And those things are our responsibilities. One prayer we must always pray. God, every time your word has come, help me to differentiate between what is my own responsibility and what is your own. So I don't waste my time and yours. So you don't waste your time and waste God's time and and you are telling God to do the one you should do. We were having a discussion in the car this morning about Elijah and Elisha and you know the Lord. We know we we spoke about Elijah, Elijah some weeks ago when God said, "Anoint Jehu, anoint Azael, anoint Elisha." And you know the discussion came up in the convention, and he didn't anoint Jehu, he didn't anoint Azael. He only went to anoint Elisha, and even the the anointing we are talking about, he just went and smote him and walked. And then the man ran and followed him, and he said. What is my own with your own? <laughs> why are you here? You can we can go into the debate of why he did that, but the bottom line is because of that, it took from the time Elijah followed him to the time Elijah became the next prophet was more than twenty years. But what that means is that for twenty years Jehu was waiting to enter his destiny, as a hell was waiting to enter his destiny. Eventually, it was Elisha that anointed those two, and. If you go and read the book of Second Kings, once they anointed Jehu, immediately, immediately the the people around him made him king. Like immediately, when once the person, once the prophet that anointed him ran out of the house, the other people came and said, "What did that madman come tell you?" And Jehu was like, "Ah, oh, you know, uh, typical crazy people." And I like, no, 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 no. What did he say? He said, "The Lord has sent him to anoint him king." Bible says immediately all of them started to proclaim Jehu as king and immediately he entered his destiny. And then Azael, same story. The king was sick, sent Azael to the prophet Elijah to say, um, am I going to get better? The, the, the prophet says, well, you are supposed to be, you will be king. Azael went back. As I the Bible says that night, as I said, ah, the prophet said you'll be okay. He said that night, as I took a cloth and covered his face and killed him. Yes, as I took matters into his own hands, he tried to fulfill destiny by his own by with his own hands, which was wrong because he also eventually didn't end well. But the point is, this man waited twenty years to enter the destiny that God had ordained for them from the mouth of the prophet, because. The prophet did not do what he was supposed to do. And you know, in all of those 20 years, God, the Bible doesn't record that God challenged Elijah once to say, the people I asked you to anoint, why have you not anointed them? 
until he left in a chariot or in a whirlwind. He never anointed them. So when we don't take responsibility, we are not the only ones that experience a challenge, that experience a delay. Like they will always tell us that people are waiting on our obedience. People are waiting on you finally doing that thing that God has said you should do years ago. You don't know who you are holding up by virtue of you not doing what the Lord has said you should do. You don't know whose future you are delaying. You, are, you don't know whose destiny you are, you, are, you are adding more years to their waiting period. You know, somebody said that as children of God, that no child of God will lack or suffer if all children of God can hear the voice of God and obey. Many times, that thing that that brother has been asking God for is in the hand of another brother that God has been saying, go and give that thing to the other person. And that one is still busy struggling with God. I love my shoes. I love my shoes. Go and give the shoe to that other person. I love my shoe. I love my shoe. As long as that person is still holding on to it, the other person will still keep praying for the shoes. Whereas God had answered the shoes weeks ago. But the other, the person that should take the shoes there has been holding up the blessing of the other person. Now, if you think about it broadly, how many people in church are holding up the blessings of somebody else? Who, how many people in church are holding up the salvation of somebody else because you have not found the courage to mention Jesus to that person? How many, what, what are we affecting? God has been showing us recently the difference between his will and his acts. And one other major prayer which should be that the God's will will also be his acts. His will is a sovereign decision. This is what I want to do. His acts refers to what he eventually does by virtue of the agreement or disagreement of men. So God, that's why many times God wills wonderful things for men. But those men never become those things because they don't fully agree with what the Lord has said. And one of the critical mistakes that causes that is that we keep praying when it is our own responsibility to act. So just bow down your head in 30 seconds and just say, Lord, help me. Let it, there, is, there is an anointing that can come upon you that you see a spiritual statement and you immediately can tell, okay, this is my responsibility. Okay, this one belongs to God. Okay, this one, this is this is the place of oh, this particular thing is 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 the place of the leadership of the church. This one is my responsibility. That is part of what is called rightly dividing the word of truth. This word is meant for me. This word is meant for the person I met yesterday. That one is meant for the person I met two weeks ago. Okay, this one is something that only our geo can pronounce. This one is for what the resident pastor can say. This one, that you'll be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Truth is not, is not, is not always beneficial if it is said in, the, in where it should not be said. Truth is true. Truth will always be truth. But if the truth is not presented in the way it should be presented, it can kill. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. You know, uh, I heard the story of a, a, a woman that had been wanting to see the, the pastor for a while. And, but because the pastor is busy and has all this protocol, protocol, so they will screen you first stage, second stage, I think. So she never got to meet the man of God as God would have it. Um, one day, the man of God was driving and he had a flat tire. And the car stopped in front of this woman's shop. So the man of God came out while the driver was fixing, changing the tire. And the man, woman went and said, ah, Lord, uh, son, I've been trying to see you. And the man of God said, ah, sorry. Okay, can you now tell me what the problem is? So she started to narrate her problems. And the Lord opened the eyes of the man of God. He saw the issue. But because he didn't have, at this point, they were almost done with the tire. So he simply just said, oh, by the way, it is uh, a family member of yours that is behind your problem. But before the son of God could explain, the car was fixed. Man got into his car, drove off. And when she got home, she fought 
because she didn't know who. So she went home and caused drama for everybody. Was it true that it was a family member? Yes, it was. But it wasn't the complete truth. And she didn't have an understanding of the truth she had received. So she ended up causing herself more pain than necessary. She even probably went to and fought people that have been on her side all, her, all their lives. So when you receive the truth, ask for understanding. We've been taught so much today. Each of these points here, they are potentially a whole sermon in and by themselves. In and by themselves. She said, never see your life in isolation of the church. The church... Hmm, let's not even start. But just know that the church is that place. I saw a picture this week that, that encapsulates what... The, I don't know how many of us saw it. It was a picture of zebras by the river. So, like there were about, let's say, 20 zebras on this side. And there was one zebra on the other side of the river. And unfortunately, there was a lion that was hungry, that was walking around the neighborhood. Which one do you think the lion went for? The one that is, ex that is the perfect picture of why we come to church. Because the Bible says, woe to him that is alone. The scripture also says, God sets the solitary in families. So church is a family. It's not enough that you join online. We must also know you so we can pray for you, so we can fellowship with you. Even if it's just a phone call, sometimes God can just say, call that person and just say, how are you? Like she was saying, sometimes it's a phone call. People are a phone call away from suicide. Sometimes people are a phone call away from making the biggest mistakes of their life. I remember one of the servants of God that came for the convention gave a testimony of, of the wife was praying and she suddenly felt a, a nudge to call a particular brother. So she picked up the phone and called him and said, meet me in the office now. When the brother got to the church, he was shivering. You know what happened? He, was, he had brought a lady to the house. They had gotten naked. They were at the point of getting busy when the phone call came in and the other guy said, Beat me in church now. <laughs> maybe you know, maybe maybe that maybe that one would have been the maybe that would have been his own Delilah. You know, it wasn't the first time Samson was going around. He, he, Samson was busy in that valley of Shorek. He, all the ladies there were his concubines. Until the day he met the one that was called Delilah, and that was the hand of him. So God has a way of looking out for people. But if you isolate yourself, like she also told us that we cannot force ourselves on God, the same way God cannot force himself on, on us. So if, if God wants to save you, and you have put up walls that make you impossible to reach, or you do not want to be told, you feel like you don't need the church that tells you what to do. It is God that tells everybody what to do. And the same way God won't force you, the same way also the church won't force you. You know, it's, it's not school that if you don't attend, if you fail, they will say, repeat a class. Church, nobody will ask you to repeat. It is life. Life itself <laughs> will, is the one that will, that will, the Lord help us in Jesus' name.